Welcome to the sixth episode of the Halihewa podcast with your host, Abigail Kima. This podcast interviews powerful African experts and activists as we invite them to share their personal experiences while they advocate for climate justice in their unique capacities. Today we are joined by such powerful women who are making efforts in creating a better world for communities who are at the forefront of the impacts of climate change. Ina Maria Shikongo is an artist, fashion designer, activist, and celebrates the power of being an African woman every day. Vowing to stop a planetary disaster, she has rallied humans from across the world to stop a Canadian company from drilling for fossil fuels in her country, Namibia. The Okavango Delta is home to some of Africa's most ancient communities and the largest surviving elephant herd. Canadian oil and gas company Recon Africa has already begun exploratory drilling in the region. Tepora Bowman is a Canadian environmental activist, campaigner and writer. She has been designing environmental campaigns and working on environmental policy in Canada and beyond for over 30 years. She is currently the International Program Director at Stand Earth and the Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. She is the co-founder of the Global Gas and Oil Network, the former co-director of Greenpeace International Global Climate and Energy Program and co-founder of Forest Ethics, which is now Stand Earth. In 2019, she received the Climate Breakthrough Award, which aims to drive breakthrough global strategies on climate change. And in 2021, she gave a widely viewed TED Talk presenting the case for a global treaty to face out fossil fuels. Welcome to the Halihawa podcast. It is so amazing to have you both on set today. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Ina, um, I read out your bio and I found it very interesting and you are very multi-talented and you have quite a story. So how does being a fashion designer and an artist gel with activism and when did this all start for you? Um, I think artists, most artists, we, we use art as an expression um, to speak about what it is that we may not um, or that we find difficult to express in everyday life but uh, art is a form of activism and i have used art as a tool uh, way before i started speaking up um, but having grown up in uh, warlike situations we were already taught to be activists in a way i remember being a uh, you know, in the Swapo camps, one of the chants that we used to sing out loud was down capitalism down. So it was sort of, it is, it's a sort of in my DNA, but speaking up is something I, I just started really embracing um, recently when I just had to step in because even though I am also a co-founder and coordinator of Fridays for Future Ventok, it was just not fair to let uh, people with less experience step in because it's it's it is a heavy subject but so to say i always say i am a born activist <laughs> born an activist yeah so and tepora um you have actually put your life on the line fighting for the protection of forests and indigenous people and nature in general and you have driven extraordinarily impactful work on climate and energy. Um, can you share with our audience something of your experience as an activist and why this work is so important for you as a person? Sure. Well, thank you for that thoughtful question. I, you know, I guess I'll start with why the work is important to me. In in some ways, I feel like I can't imagine doing anything else at this moment in history. You know, we're bombarded every day with, with uh, you know, quite terrible news. We're, we're living in the climate era now and, and, we, and we see the impacts of the heat waves and the floods and uh, all over the world. And, and I, I think of it as, um, you know, I think hope is not something you have. I, I, I feel like it's something you do. And every day in the morning, every day when I get up in the morning, I feel so lucky that I have this work to do with people I know who, who feel uh, the same way. 
I, there's an old adage, you know, that action is the antidote to despair. And, and that's how I feel when I, when I stand with indigenous leadership on the front lines, you know, blocking an oil project, or when I, I work with brilliant climate policy experts to design the, the fossil fuel treaty, I just, um, it, 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 it gives me hope to be able to be doing something that is uh, that could make the changes that we need to see at this moment in history. But I, I started this work, in fact, because of just a love for nature, a love for forests and, and, a, and an awe of this incredibly complex, beautiful world that we live in. And I was pretty horrified as a, as a young university student now 30 years ago, uh, that even in Canada, our old growth forests, trees that were a thousand years old, were being logged to make paper, to make toilet paper, for crying out loud. And, and that was what motivated me to kind of get out of the ivory towers of university and, and, and really find out what was going on in local communities and, and learn about the really the politics of extraction and start thinking about what is it, what is it I can do? Uh, to make social change, and and since then I feel like I've I've tried a lot, a lot of things, everything that I could think of in my toolbox. You know, I've boycotted, I've blockaded, I've I've you know been appointed by governments to to design policy, and and I think there's no one right way to do this. I think we need everyone to do everything they can at this moment, and and I and I feel very lucky that I um, am able to do this. But also uh, very privileged. I mean, you said you, you said you said I've I've put my life on the line. I put my freedom on the line. That's for sure. I've been to jail a couple of times, and I don't like it. <laughs> but, um, but I think as a Canadian activist, as a as a as a white middle class woman, I I I know having had the experience to work with so many colleagues across Latin America, across countries in Africa, that that. Um, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I don't, I don't face the same kind of uh, threats and persecution that many uh, environmental leaders do in other countries. And I think um, one thing that uh, I want to give you your flowers is, I think we are all sort of experiencing something at some point in our lives and it takes courage and boldness to actually do something about it. So you, I just want to appreciate the kind of work that you're already doing. Um, and moving to fossil fuels, which is quite um, a topic um, that is very, that is becoming um, a contentious issue in the climate space. And so the burning of fossil fuels, which is called oil and gas, is by far the greatest contributor to climate change. And the IPCC report that was released in the year uh, made it clear that burning existing and planned fossil fuel projects will destroy humanity and the chance of us actually having a safe future. And we still see in Africa that there's relentless effort to expand fossil fuel projects, for example, the East Africa crude oil pipeline which is normally known as ECOP. And then we also have the oil drilling in Okavango Delta, which, is, which we are going to talk about in detail. And so for Ina, as an activist, you have strongly advocated for the total phase out of oil and gas, uh, even though you live in a country where energy access is a serious challenge and a development issue. And unfortunately, a Canadian oil and gas company came to your homeland and in 2020 were given a green light to drill oil at the Okavango Delta. Uh, what was it like for you hearing the news? Um, for me, it was a flashback, a flashback to the times when I was a refugee uh, born in Angola, not knowing who my parents are, and growing up in uh, destabilized circumstances. For me, that is what came up. And I saw the Niger Delta, and I know how beautiful the Kavango Delta is or the Kavango Basin is. It's the only forest we have in Namibia. So no, you know, it is, we don't need the repetition of history. So even when we talk about energy access and energy poverty, those are colonial terms because we don't need gas and oil. Even if you look at our infrastructure, we don't, we don't even have infrastructure for it. So why are you drilling for, for it in the first place? Okay. It, is, it is to repeat 
what happens in the Niger Delta? First of all, because it is being taken out, polluting our waters, and going out of the country. Namibia is the driest country in sub-Saharan Africa. So we have to protect our water reserves that are underground already because we as Namibian people or as the Sun people, especially the Sun people, the only people in the world that know how to survive without surface water. You know, it is, we need to protect the sources for the people. So projects like ECO, projects like this Kavango oil drilling or, or the hope to apparently develop energy access to Africa. That is just plain greenwashing, lying and the continuation of colonialism and uh, destabilizing the continent further because where there is oil, there is war in Africa. Give me one country in Africa where there is no conflict because of war. And why? It is easier to take out the resources when there is no control, unless if there are funny deals that have been signed and that they are being stuck to. So this specific, these specific projects, they need to be stopped because we need to talk about reparations, cancellations of debts. We need to talk about loss and damage and how we can really create a better future for humanity as a whole. Because whatever happens on our continent is impacting everyone else. Everyone else is being, is being impacted. We have one carbon budget. So we need to stop this project for the sake of humanity, not even for the sake of our people, because I know that our lives have always been negatively impacted because of other people coming to our continent telling us how we should develop. So are we really poor in terms of energy as Africans? We need to ask ourselves those questions. We need to move away from the colonial ways of how people tell us how to develop you know we are we are the happiest people on the planet indigenous nations we are the happiest go to canada or germany people are walking with faces like that all the time and they've got electricity they have this you know they have a, a, a instant supply of junk and we have our hearts but you you go to the village you see the children dancing so what is the definition of happiness what is the definition of development and I think that is where the colonial work is very, very important, also in what we do. And it's embracing our heritage as Africans, regardless of what it looks like to non-Africans. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah, very powerful remarks. And just I am reflecting on truly redefining what we what we regard as happiness or what we regard as energy access. I mean, who are we before? all this and it's so it's such an important question that we should all ask ourselves and so as fate would have it you both co-authored a piece of writing earlier in the in the year um and the article is called fossil fuel extraction threatens africa's remaining elephants and uh, well i will link this to the show notes and when i was reading the article i was struck by your depiction of petrocolonialism which is something you've also put across as colonialist mindsets and here's a short expert for our listeners at the site of the recon africa's first oil well canada's flag flutters above namibia's violating the country's national constitution, which stipulates that the Namibian flag must be flown or as, on a separate staff from other international or national flags. Sephora, do you mind unpacking this idea a little further for our listeners, the link between colonialism, fossil fuels, and climate change, which Ina has touched on a bit? Oh, just the easy question. <laughs> yes. Very easy you, know, you mentioned in your in 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 your intro um, that according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, fossil fuels, just three products, oil, gas, and coal, are responsible for 86% of the carbon emissions that are trapped in our atmosphere and smothering the earth over the last decade. And the you know, the, what we continually see is that the fossil fuel industry wants to maintain that development because they're making record profits, billions of dollars, and they're, and they're siphoning billions of dollars off governments around the world using taxpayers' money as subsidies to build these projects. They, um, uh, you know, use the uh, need for energy and people's concerns about energy access as an excuse to push more and more of these uh, 
projects onto communities. But as you know, as Anna Maria so eloquently said, the, the majority of these projects, especially the new ones proposed in many countries in Africa, they're not to provide energy for Africans. They're, they're export projects that will leave behind the polluted rivers, the polluted land. Um, and, and they're designed to make, again, record profits for these big companies, some of which are in Canada, the majority of are, are, are from wealthy countries. And, and you know, so it, it's why today fossil fuels are the greatest cause of climate change, but they're also the greatest cause of death. One in five people die just from the air pollution of fossil fuels alone around, around the planet. So today, fossil fuels are our weapons of mass destruction. And, and, and they're also the weapons of mass colonialization. The development of this billion dollars of infrastructure creates a dependence uh, in, the, in the economy. There are now you know, many countries that are just planning new drilling and new fossil fuel development just to feed their debts because they're hooked on it. And in the article you mentioned, Ina Maria, and I described the specific case of the Okavagan Delta, but unfortunately, this is a pattern that we see repeated all over the world, appropriation of resource-rich land, exploitation of those resources, and then exportation of the resources by wealthy countries and companies at the expense of local people and local livelihoods and, and, and cultures. And when Ina and I referred to the flag of Canada, um, you know, the, which, you know, it, it exploits the oil and gas resources of the region via the Canadian multinational Recon Africa. What we're trying to denounce is also the power and influence of the fossil fuel industry, which sometimes has more political power than the countries themselves. So we, we have examples of petrocolonialism constantly. Just last week, the African Energy Week was held in Cape Town, was attended not only by top African and European leaders, but also by representatives of the fossil fuel industry themselves in order to secure their own future ahead of COP27. You know, the fossil fuel industry permanently intervenes in all of the governance spaces we're in a moment when we know we need to phase down fossil fuels. Everybody's talking about it, but somehow they have distorted the conversation in, in Africa. So talking about a just transition includes expanding fossil fuel production. Well, it's not a transition if we're growing the problem, especially when we're seeing the worst impacts of climate change in many countries in, in, in Africa. So, you know, I, I think the... What they mask is that right now, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. It is, the technology is there to, to not use fossil fuels and provide uh, many more people with access to energy. In fact, renewable energy is designed in a way that it is distributed. It's most powerful when it's in communities and communities own the source of their power. But what the fossil fuel industry doesn't like is then they don't own it. So they don't much make as much profits off renewable energy as fossil energy. And that's why they're continuing to push this, this narrative now that they're somehow the saviors of energy poverty. Well, there are 600 million people across Africa that don't have any energy and the fossil fuel industry has had a hundred years to do it. Yeah. So they didn't do it. They didn't design systems for energy poverty. They're not going to design those systems. And now we need to try something new. I mean, the definition of insanity is just continuing to do the thing that's not working. And fossil fuel industry is not working for the people. It's not working for the planet. Out of that, and your experience working in climate and energy, you launched the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I imagine this is very ambitious, being that we, like you said, we live in a world where still 
uh, oil, oil and gas companies somehow have influence when it comes to policy making and decisions. So uh, can you describe in a few sentences what this campaign is and how and why is it relevant for people living in African countries who are constantly being pushed to expand new oil or new gas uh, sites? Well, you know, what's really shocking is that although we have the Paris Agreement, which is a historic climate agreement um, that really helps countries, pushes countries to negotiate emissions decline, so the decline of how much pollution they produce and to increase their targets of an ambition of what we're trying to do. What we realized at the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty is that there are currently very few mechanisms to, uh, to regulate who gets to produce fossil fuels and where. And so the, the, the theory behind climate agreements and climate policy has been that we, we negotiate these agreements on emissions, that the demand for fossil fuels goes down and the markets, well, the markets will regulate the supply and decrease what's being produced. The problem is it's not working because the markets are distorted by the IMF says fossil fuel subsidies are $11 million a minute right now around the world. That's how much money, taxpayers' money, we're giving to the fossil fuel industry. So that's keeping these companies and projects alive, even though the demand is declining and, and new policies are being put in place in order to re reduce demand. And so the bottom line is right now, we're on track to produce 110% more fossil fuels on the planet than we can ever use and stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, the top 20 oil and gas companies plan to produce $930 billion of new oil and gas projects between now and 2030. So we desperately need new international cooperation to agree to stop the expansion of fossil fuels. So we can't turn off the taps overnight. Many of our countries still use fossil fuels every day. But what we can do is we can commit together to stop expanding the problem and then manage the wind down of fossil fuels in a way that is equitable and fair. And that's critical for countries in Africa because why is it that, that the wealthy countries have the majority of new expansion and, and, and production? The, we, we need to ensure that principles of equity, who has produced this climate problem in the first place, but also we need to look at how hard is it for countries to phase down their use and production of fossil fuels? How much percentage of the GDP is it? How many jobs? And those, should, those factors should go into consideration while, they're, while we're deciding who gets to produce what and how much. And we need countries to cooperate on those rules. And so we've started creating a framework for that, roughly based on nuclear non-proliferation. And honestly, it's been a pretty crazy wild ride. We, we only launched the fossil fuel treaty 24, 25 months ago. Mm -hmm. and, and in that time, we have had support and endorsement of the concept from 69 cities, cities from all over the world, passing motions, calling on their national governments to endorse a fossil fuel treaty. 101 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama, hundreds of faith groups around the world, including the Vatican. And just last month, the World Health Organization endorsed the fossil fuel treaty and the first country put it on the floor of the UN General Assembly, Vanuatu. And last week, the European Parliament passed a motion calling on countries to start negotiating the treaty. So we're really excited about the pickup around the world. And, and we, we need to continue building both the ideas and principles for how countries can negotiate an agreement in order to meet the goals of the Paris Accord. This is not in, 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 in contrast to the Paris Agreement. It's a it's new agreements that would help constrain the production of fossil fuels. It is a global agreement to constrain all fossil fuels. So it's hard to get it in a few sentences. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I'm just sitting here and um, obviously there's been 
uh, some sort of reception um, of the treaty and with uh, organization and countries actually signing in on it. And so for Ina, do you have hope that African countries are actually going to welcome the idea of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty? Just, yeah, I know this is out of the box, but do you have hope? Um, have hope? Until last week, I thought uh, Kenya would be one of the countries, but after today's headlines, I'm shaking my head. Um, I have big hopes for Rwanda because Rwanda is actually doing it. Um, it is, they are pushing for a solar, they are pushing for indigenous knowledge, and it is just not being done on village scales, but literally. Uh, on a national scale, you, you drive through the city and uh, you can see uh, 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 permaculture techniques or traditional or indigenous techniques that are being employed to rehabilitate the land. So I have faith in uh, Paul Kagame definitely that he could be our first African leader to set the trend. Um, but our other ones, I think, they are so yes yes thank you for being politically correct on my behalf but i would still <laughs> like to bash them a little bit uh i feel like our leaders are being held on a hook like Tapora was talking about the debt that debt is such a major hindrance when it comes to development i mean like for example recon africa has got 90 percent of shares and our government 10 so that is not even contributing to what the country needs. And these are the little problems within these policies and agreements that are being uh, designed that don't really benefit us. So um, yeah, we need to help decolonize our leaders and help them redefine themselves as Africans, you know, like do not forget our fathers who died in the liberation struggle. You know, our fathers were on the front line. And now it's like, hello, mm, mm, they are dead. The ones that are living, they are now doing what our fathers were fighting for. I mean, they are, they are, they are, they are doing exactly that which our parents were fighting against. So we need to re-educate our leaders. We are the future. And if they are doing something wrong, we should not be afraid to tell them, I'm, I'm sorry, Tate, Tate means mister. Uh, uh, enough is enough, you know. We should be bold enough and stand up and tell them, I am sorry. But thank you for helping me to be diplomatically correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so moving on to um, the Russia's war on Ukraine, and we have watched in horror the devastating consequences of the war uh, with terrible physical and emotional risks to the people of Ukraine. And as a result of the violent conflict, we've, we've also all felt some sort of impact when it comes to food and energy shortage and the price shocks as global supply chains are disrupted. So, uh, Tepora, can you help our listeners understand the link between fossil fuels and the Russian, the Russia's war on Ukraine and also why there's suddenly so much global attention on Africa's fossil gas resources? Well, First of all, this is a, a fossil fuel fueled war in a in a in a number of ways. The the money um, that is pouring into Putin's efforts comes from uh, fossil fuel exploitation. The the power that Putin is using to try and um, bully uh, not only Ukraine but other countries, especially Europe, by by turning off. Uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, resources, it, and the the what what this war points out is the vulnerability of fossil fuel systems to choke points, to individual dictators having the ability um, to freeze out in literal terms um, a continent or a country, um, and and it and it also um, uh, really uh, points out that this uh, that our systems are so vulnerable, not to price shocks, and also to um, individual uh, dictatorships. The fact is that the bombs hadn't even the first bombs hadn't even fallen on the Ukraine 
before the fossil fuel industry was in there, using the excuse of the war to expand fossil fuels. And so now they are exploiting this terrible moment to, to argue that um, we therefore need to, to produce more and more fossil fuels, put in more gas infrastructure around the world in order to fight Putin. But that digs the hole even deeper because um, think about it. If we have renewable energy systems, if we have offshore wind turbines, how vulnerable are they uh, to, to, to dictators and price shocks? Well, they certainly can't be sabotaged and have globally significant methane leaks. You attack a wind for turbine and the turbines just start moving for a minute. <laughs> You know, look at the, the 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 fact is that renewable energy is just cleaner and safer, and 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 so this push by the fossil fuel industry in order to double down uh, ignores the fact that we're in this terrible situation, and Putin has been able to exploit this terrible situation because fo the fossil fuel system is so is so vulnerable and dangerous. And um, you talk, you've said that, and then I remembered um, what the Dalai Lama said. I was in India just last week and had an opportunity to be in his audience. And he said, um, it's ironic that uh, when people claim that they want to attain world peace, they actually make more weapons. So, I mean, are we really making sense? So it's like exactly. sort of a similar analogy. And um, so... Ina, what an um, amazing experience. You were just with the Dalai Lama? Oh, oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. we should be interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> I will catch you after this. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was really a beautiful experience. And he um his message was very clear of oneness, warm-heartedness, and and seeing ourselves as brothers and sisters and recognizing that if I am your brother and, uh, and you're my sister. There's no way I can do something that is detrimental to you. And I think this is something we should also, you know, include in this fight, like really thinking about people as we decide to make millions of billions out of fossil fuels, which are uh, causing, um, taking away lives of people and ruining the biodiversity completely. Uh, well, so can I build mm -hmm. on that for a minute? Because I think that that is why we're calling for a fossil fuel treaty to stop expansion and manage the wind down of fossil fuel production. Because workers and their families around the world who currently work in the fossil fuel industry deserve a plan. They deserve a plan of how we are going to manage to ensure that no one is left behind. The fossil fuel system and industry will decline. We know that. I mean, 150 countries, is it? No, sorry, 50 countries have already passed policies to ban the fossil fuel car. The world is changing very quickly because we know that it that fossil fuels are a threat to our future. And, and, and because new technologies and cleaner systems like electric vehicles are now available at scale. So the question in front of us is, will this be an unmanaged decline of fossil fuels over time? And will it be fast enough to ensure the majority of people in areas of the planet are safe from heat waves and floods and fires? Or will it be an unmanaged decline that, that, is, that is slow, that is late, that it leaves more communities in strife and, and a boom and bust as fossil fuel, as, as support for fossil fuels dries up and, 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 and workers and their families don't have a plan. And if we build more massive infrastructure across Africa, we're just making more people dependent on a system that doesn't have a long-term life because 190 countries have committed to the Paris Agreement to phase out fossil fuels, to get to net zero by 2050. Well, you don't get to zero by building more of a problem. As an activist, Ina, how do you navigate your way through narratives linking fossil fuels, conflict and development needs? And are there any particular challenges that you have experienced in your fight and push against these narratives? Um, it always goes back to colonialism, you know, and self was, you know, 
we are like starting to sound like a broken record. It's like the fossil fuel industry is there to impose itself on us, you know? It, like here in my home, um, especially the farmers, because it's a dry country, uh, we have boreholes, for example. So almost every single farmer uses a solar panel to uh, to help his pump pull up the water. So, uh, for example, in my grandmother's village, we have little solar lamps that we use for charging our phones. Um, and it is still helping us have energy access, but at the same time, we are still in tune with our natural cycle, you know? We go to bed when the sun goes down. We come up with the sun. You know, in the morning, that is when we are working the fields. In the afternoon, it is too hot. That is when we are resting. And we are very happy. So the biggest problem is a history, colonialism. And the fact that even us as Africans have forgotten who we are where we come from because we were obviously taught to devalue ourselves because you always had to be like those missionaries you know who told us that our gods were evil uh, now we need to develop and become like dubai or become like uh, london or paris but you know we we are not there yet i mean colonialism has tried to uh the i mean not only colonialism but also slavery they have tried to take that which is within us out of us but we, they they still have not managed like how many tribes are still living like they used to how, thousands of years ago even if it is not exactly according to the book so history and colonialism and what we call development is actually still rooted in the same practices even if you look at how the fossil fuel industry is actually operating now there is no difference between when you look at all these energy conferences that uh, Tsepora was just talking about in the Berlin Convention of 1894, you know, when the, when the Western countries were sitting down and cutting up our continent like a slice of cake. And that is exactly what they're doing, you know. Uh, recently, Total... Uh, um, uh, announced that they are going to start drilling for gas and oil on the world on the wild coast when uh, when the when the when the people of South Africa just decided that they don't want shell you know so after shell comes total hmm? even if you look at just look at the energy map and see where those companies are they are doing the exact same thing that our colonizers did they are using the same uh, the same methods you know we as Africans what our philosophy is uhuru you know togetherness and even that has been broken apart we used to identify ourselves according to our clans you know i'm from the clan of the aqualuvala you know the spotted ones you may be from the clan of the elephants but the same clans that you find in southern africa are also in eastern africa and that is our identity not the fact that you are kenyan or that i am namibian but who are we? Our challenges are rooted within history and the fact that we are not taught our own history. You okay. know? And the fossil fuel industry is using the same narrative that our colonizers used. Um, uh, going down that, <laughs> that conversation for me would become very passionate and we'll probably speak until tomorrow morning. <laughs> but <laughs> I completely agree with you uh, on how the systems are set up and it's it's almost as if we are set up to fail so, and um i guess it's there has to be an awakening of africa to actually understand who we are and decolonize our brain and see that we have everything we need to be happy Recently, African civil societies have come together to launch a campaign called Don't Gas Africa, which is an urgent call to ensure that Afri the African Union does not support expanding fossil fuel extractions ahead of COP27. And Sephora, you had touched on it briefly when you were talking about the war. Uh, so tell us more about this campaign and how we can all support the movement ahead of COP27. Sure. Um, it's a very inspiring campaign. This is a campaign led by several African organizations, including 350 Africa, Decolonize, PowerShift Africa, and, and, and many others. And it, it brings together African and international civil society organizations to ensure that the African 
continent is not locked into more fossil fuel production. It's a really, I think, key campaign in ahead of COP27, uh, which of course is being heralded as the African COP. So it was launched in August uh, around a, a letter by African civil society calling on African heads of state and ministers to reject the proposal from a technical committee of the African Union for an African common position on energy access and transition, which was to be launched at COP27. Fortunately, African diplomats responsible for COP27 have now directly pushed back on the pro-fossil fuel position. Another key action of the Don't Gas Africa campaign took place last week during the Africa Energy Week I mentioned. African civil society organization were present every morning outside the conference venue in Cape Town denouncing the African Energy Week agenda, which under the guise of partnerships for a just transition, again, transition, mm. it, it consisted of basically a battle plan for the fossil fuel industry in European countries to expand gas production across the continent. So look, I, I, I don't wanna to speak too much on behalf of our African partners, but the campaign I understand is going to coordinate more mobilizations and more advocacy actions calling for an end to fossil fuel induced energy apartheid in the region and for international support for the development of cost effective, cleaner and safer people owned renewable energy system in order to meet the needs of people and communities across the continent. And it's a critical moment because there are uh, so many new proposals to start pushing new fossil fuel development uh, across the continent, um, which will make you know Africa, African countries more vulnerable to price shocks, to control by these major uh, dirty uh, international corporations who are who are making record profits. Um, and as we know from the legacy of oil and gas production already across Africa, uh, will will we'll leave communities poorer and dealing with the the pollution from these projects uh, uh, when the companies eventually leave. Well, oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I think there's a website which I can link on the description, and everyone can see and read through the document and understand how they can exactly support. So, thank you so much. We move to the climate education bit. Um, and Ina, when I read through your bio, you set up an NGO with your friends around permaculture initiative seeking to beautify children's playgrounds with sustainable gardening. And um, I guess it is through this experience that you got to deeply understand sustainability and also became aware of the lack of information around the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. So are you still working on this and how are you also incorporating your art uh, to sort of create awareness and, and build climate literacy within your community? Um, yes, I am still doing it very much. And I think it's the most fun part of being a climate activist, just being with uh, the youth and um, and just interacting with them. Uh, and yes, my art and fashion design background has a vital role to play in it. To, well, it plays a vital role in this because I use the same techniques that I was taught in school, which is basically draw, you know, write, write, your, write your story, and then you create your drawing, and then after that, you create your garment. So basically, uh, when I when we go speak to the children, we always have a subject, maybe plastic pollution, or uh, let's say uh, the other day we were talking about the, um, the latest IPCC reports, but it also depends on uh, what age level they are, you know. So sometimes they are older students, sometimes they are young, and sometimes they are really tiny little kids and uh, and for them to be able to write and express themselves has been so um, it has been a motivational factor to me because I give them the opportunity to not just to write a story but uh, some some of them they write poems and I've also realized how creative they are and also given that Namibia does not have art education anymore just giving them paint and letting them splash all over it makes it so much fun for them to really dive into the subjects and talk about it. So yes, we do plant trees as well. 
but I don't always try and impose my ideas on the on the people that I'm working with, but I try and find out from them what exactly is going on within the communities. So it has been a very fruitful um, uh, exchange and program that I'm definitely still going to continue because I know that there is also a, um, there is no specific platform that that caters for the youth or often or orphans where they can talk about the issues within the communities because nobody nobody talks about them they don't have the terminology because they don't even know that people are actually talking about the climate crisis or the fact that um, uh, people are doing sand mining they can see very well that it is affecting the flow of the rivers they can see that overgrazing is uh, it is affecting their environment they can see that trees are not growing because every time a small tree comes up a goat comes to eat it but then again the sand mining is also impacting the fact that the water does not uh, distribute it equally within the landscape so it has been an inspirational journey and it keeps on inspiring me and it's i must say that these types of projects that's where you really see the 50 50 exchange between um between myself and my group uh the fridays for future team and also our communities that we work with and it's funny because we do follow up as well and each time we go in it's the children have even more to say and they feel even more comfortable to express themselves and coming from an african perspective where children are taught to shut up I think it is so important to continue this exchange with the youth, mm -hmm. not even being political, but also teaching them how to rehabilitate their own lands with their own means without having to wait for governments. Because if we wait for governments, we will wait until we are a thousand years old. So w the change starts with us. Basically, that is our approach. Mm -hmm. the, st the change starts with mm -hmm. you and not your government. Mm -hmm. And I share the same sentiments because I genuinely have more hope in communities because that is where you see people actually working hard to to make their lives better. And I think I something that was was uh, quite a beautiful experience for me was traveling to the western part of Kenya and I saw women using different non-machinery technologies to adapt to the impacts of climate change and they're really changing their lives transforming themselves and yeah. of course policy i mean there, there wasn't any kind of policy they just came together were trained and now are really taking the lesson seriously and they're able to take their kids to school they're making more money they're happy so i do have more hope in community and true uh, it starts with us and um, we now move to the yeah. final segment and the African COP, and I say it in quotes, is a, is a couple of days away. And um, I know we've all had sort of an expectation of what we wanted to deliver with everyone calling it an African COP. And now as Africa, I feel like people have really done a good job in trying to articulate our issues from African civil societies to the youth. And so, Tepora, uh, what do you hope that COP would deliver? Um... Last year, we went into COP as the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative and Network with a, a very simple demand that, that our leaders start to have the courage for the first time to say the F word, yeah. fossil fuels. <laughs> and it, it sounds a little crazy, but the fact is that even though fossil fuels are at the root of the problem and cause the problem, the Paris Agreement doesn't even include the words fossil fuels or oil, gas, and coal. Until yeah. last year, we were successful in getting the, the Glasgow agreements to, to, to acknowledge the need um, to phase out fossil fuels, but um, they did it by saying we need to phase down unabated coal. So, at this COP, I think we all have to be looking at those words, unabated, abated, efficient subsidies versus inefficient subsidies. These are loopholes that the fossil fuel industry is inserting into countries' national determined climate uh, action plans, into the language of uh, COPs and the Paris Agreement in order to allow them to continue to build new projects while they promise 
carbon capture and storage and, and more uh, trees planted and bioenergy, which isn't happening today. So at this COP, not only are we asking countries to, to say the words, we're looking to see what countries and whether or not this process actually stands up to the fossil fuel industry. We are in a climate emergency right now. 33 million people this year were displaced in Pakistan alone because of the floods. And of course, now we're seeing so much, so many impacts of heat waves and droughts and floods across con countries in, in Africa. We need our elected decision makers to pick a side. They can choose people or they can choose polluters. They need to stand up to big oil at COP. And, and that means that the test for success and climate leadership is going to be whether or not these agreements and, and, and texts and, and announcements by countries and banks and companies uh, 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 have new fossil fuel production or not. Are we actually in a transition and stopping new fossil fuel production? And, and, that, and that has to be core. Um, I think the, the other critical issue at this COP is we need the wealthy countries to step up and put the money on the table that they promised years ago for loss and damage. The, the, the fact mm -hmm. is that we're nowhere closer this year than we were two years ago uh, to the $100 billion that they've already promised. And loss and damage is the tip of the iceberg. That's just the agreement to deal with the reparations. What about new funds that would actually support a just transition and countries keeping carbon in the ground and diversifying their economies and having the money to build the infrastructure that they need for clean electrification systems? So, so I think I think I think those are the the, the critical issues that that we're looking at in the run up to COP twenty seven. Yeah. Um, thank you for highlighting that. And then Ina, from an African perspective, um, what do you want to see, or what would you say was a successful COP come two weeks after we are done? What would you say is a successful COP? Um, it is, it is a very difficult question. I mean, <laughs> it's very easy, but very difficult. Um, being a victim of war, and also seeing how uh, how international and geopolitics has been influencing our lives, um, I would really like I would really like to see uh, loss and damage and reparations being you know taken by the by the horn. Uh, a fossil fuel face that would be for me it I would be in heaven if we if we really speak about it, but. I personally don't have much faith in my African leaders anymore. And I'm also talking from a personal point of view and also because I see what is happening to countries where fossil fuels are very active, like in Mozambique right now, in Gabo Delgado. So for me, to be honest with you, it would be really addressing the challenge of loss and damage. But from a spiritual point of view, for me, a successful COP would be to see the spirits of our ancestors, of Mother Isis, rising again and standing up with us and protecting our Earth and our planet, that is that 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 for me would be a successful cop and a successful, uh, um, like on a uh, spiritual African uh, perspective, because that is the land of our ancestors, and we need to reclaim that history. And it starts off by calling them out and making them come out from the ground. I don't care what they do. I don't have faith in my leaders, but I have faith in my ancestors. And that is why I would rather call upon ISIS to influence this specific cop. Thank you. <laughs> I would honestly sit down and listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> so passionately about Africa and the history and because I, I really do have this 
um, uh, I don't know, passion to just sort of understand our culture because, you know, a lot of that was distorted along the way. Yes. Um, I have really had an amazing, honestly, this has been the best uh, episode I have ever shot and I can't wait to edit and share it with the world because you've all spoken so passionately and I can, fe- I can feel it from your heart and I do hope that... Um, you know, people will listen and really hear what we are saying uh, as humans and not just people who are trying to make profits out of, at the expense of, of other people. You know, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a couple more countries join the Fossil Fuel Treaty at COP. Yay. Yeah, awesome. so it's going to be exciting.